Look at verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. See, God says everyone sinned. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ. So remember, that promise that God gave through Abraham about the spiritual promise concerning Jesus Christ to seed. And it's based on faith, right? Remember, based on faith. See this promise? Based on faith. Based on faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's why we believe in it. Once you believe, that promise is applicable to us. So what is very good about this verse is that when you look at verse 22 and verse 21, you can point out to them that everyone has sinned. So if a Jew believes the works of the law is required for salvation, Paul argued this. The scripture hath concluded all under sin, right? Ask a Jew if he sinned before, and he's going to admit that he's sinned. Now the problem is this then. The problem is, when you look back at our main text right here, remember verse 10? Did you recall verse 10? If you fail to keep everything under the law, you're cursed. So ask a Jew, okay, do you believe the law can give you eternal life for salvation? Yes, I do. Okay, then, like Paul argued, then we should have still lived according to that. But another thing is this, when's the last time you gave an animal sacrifice? Isn't that what the law said? What, are you wearing mixed fabric right now? Isn't that what the law said? You can't wear mixed fabric? Oh, what about your hair? How are you cutting your hair? Oh, look at that. You, you cut a part of your hair right here. That You broke the law right there. Did you stone somebody to death? When's the last time you stoned somebody to death? Oh, you broke the law right there. See, the Jews are the biggest lawbreakers today. If they really believe Old Testament law, Judaism is still ongoing. So Paul argued right here, see, everyone broke the law. So what is a powerful argument to a Jew is this. Doesn't it make more sense that salvation is gained by a sinless substitute who fulfilled the law for you rather than you yourself who always broke the law? Yeah. So use that argument against a Jew. When you witness to a Jew, <clears throat> you can prove to him that works of the law, he's not saved. You can prove that to him by pointing out all the things that he broke in the law. Now another thing is this, is that there are anti-dispensationalists who will use these two verses then to prove that the law does not give eternal life. Because dispensationalists, what we argue, is that salvation during the Old Testament law was faith and works during the Old Testament. That's what we argue. During the Old Testament, especially during the time of the law of Moses, it was faith and works. We believe that's how you gain life. But here's the problem. When you look at that verse, it says in verse uh, 21, look at the middle. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Remember at that verse, Paul said that life, the law cannot give life. That's what he's basically saying. So then the anti-dispensationalists, they will take advantage of that, where because life cannot be gained under the law, that means then when we teach that faith and works is required for salvation during the Old Testament law to receive life, then we're teaching heresy. That's what they're going to argue. But the problem is this. The problem with this group that argues against different salvations throughout different dispensations and who argue Galatians chapter 3, verse 21 through 22, the problem is this. One, they're pulling up Paul's verse. Two, here's another thing. Show me in the Old Testament, show me in the Old Testament where the Bible did not say that you had to have faith and works to receive salvation or life. Do you know how many verses there are on that? Here's one example. Let's go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. When you look up the word life throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, it is filled with faith and works, faith and works, faith and works. If you want to prove life without works, you know where you're going to find it? Paul. And you're not going to convince a Jew that way. You're not going to convince a Jew that way through Paul's writing. That's why a lot of people hate the Apostle Paul. Heretics, different heretical groups hate the Apostle Paul. If you want to win a Jew to salvation, you've got to use the Old Testament. And when you use the Old Testament, you've got to admit some places are hard Jewish doctrine that you can't force down in a Christian perspective. 
you have to divide it off. Remember that seed promise that we talked about? We admitted the Jews have their land, the Jews have their own group of people, their seed, so we can acknowledge that with them. But we point out by rightly dividing that, there's another part right here that you fail to look at, that there is a spiritual seed, spiritual promise. Faith for salvation, not by works. See that? That would become more convincing after that. Now, let me talk about why the Bible, uh, let me first show Old Testament verses that there is life by faith and works. Matthew chapter 19, and then we'll notice verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? What did Jesus say? He said, no, no, it's not by the law. I can never give you life. It's by me. No, he didn't even die on the cross yet. Remember, Paul even admitted that. And Paul admitted the law had to be there because the seed was not there yet. So anyways, keep reading. And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But thou will enter into life. What? Keep the commandments. Verse, seven, uh, verse 18, look at that. That's the law. Verse 18, the Ten Commandments. Verse 19, the law. Look at that. Now, just look at all the other verses in your Bible, and you're going to find out that faith and works are required. The law does give life. Okay, then we got a problem here. We got a contradiction. Paul said that the law can't give you life, but Jesus said it gives you life. So you can be a heretic then, like the other people online who says Paul was a liar. Jesus even said works for salvation, said one Muslim. But here comes the apostle Paul and ruins everything. How are you going to argue? How are you going to argue? See, if you don't believe in dispensationalism, you got a time. Because you're only selecting Paul's verses. A dispensationalist looks at the whole Bible and rightly divides things. Okay, so how do we rightly divide this? Very simple. It's very simple. The life that was given under the law it could not give what? It could not give complete. It could not give a complete, full life. Yeah. So when it talks about life or saved, the completeness and the fullness was until the seed should come. Now look at the verse. Remember what Paul said? Paul said the law had to be there until the seed comes. Yeah. So in other words, the law was a temporary basis. It was something partial until this person comes in and completes the payment. Now, in everyday life, this is not hard to believe. Okay, let me give you an easy example. Let's say that you're in debt. And because you're in debt, like how the Bible talked about Jesus paid our ransom, he paid our sins in full. We sing about that hymn, right? But how we get the debt paid, you got to understand this. You have got 4,000 years until your debt was paid. What are you going to do throughout all that time? So during that time, debt had to be paid. Sin had to be paid for. Because here's the thing. If Jesus did not die to pay their sin, how are the Old Testament saints going to go to heaven? They can't get away scot-free. Oh, they were saved by faith. No, you can't do that. Then God is an unjust God allowing sin inside heaven. He has to make a full payment. But... God has to put Jesus Christ 4,000 years later. That's another problem. So how are we going to do it? It's very simple, like today. If you're in debt, what do you do? Through your own work and effort, in your credit card bill, there's a minimum payment. So you do pay it, and guess what? The payment is incomplete. And let's say that you pay it, you're like, oh man, I saved my life. See? You saved your life. Why? At that moment when you made a minimum, minimum incomplete payment. That's what sometimes the credit card bills and debts would do. Until what? The full debt is completed and paid for. See, so that makes a lot of sense then. This reconciles everything. So why, were they, why would Jesus say that you are saved or you got life? Because if I have a credit card bill that's like, you know, I'm like $10,000 in debt, and they give me a minimum payment where I pay partial payments, let's say $100 that month, I'm going to say, man, I saved my life, right? I saved my life when I did that partial, incomplete, minimum payment by my work. Yeah. That's the same thing during the Old Testament law. But guess what? My life is not fully saved. It's not a complete payment yet. 
So then I had to get the, uh, the one who paid my debt in full, and he completed it for me. See, that makes a lot of sense right here. This is just even common sense everyday life. It's just the same thing right here then, with an everyday common, everyday example. Why did God do it that way? Simple, because it's reality. Economics don't function, society don't function if we don't believe in this kind of system where there's an incomplete partial payment and complete full payments. That's just reality. That's just life. Okay, now let's keep reading right here. Let's go back to Luke 16, and then we'll call it uh, a day. All right, I got to close it right here. So I have to close it here. Look at Luke chapter 16. So here's the thing right here. No one is good enough to go. That's why it makes sense. See, everything is clicking now. That's why Old Testament saints, they couldn't go to heaven. Why is that? Why can't you go to heaven? Why is that not the case right here, Pastor? Very simple. The reason why you can't go to heaven is because your God wants sinlessness up there. But he knows at the same time, you're not going to get the sinless perfection. So I understand. So let me give you minimum payment, partial payment, where you can have partial life, partial payment, and then you can pretty much retain your life at that point until the Redeemer comes. That's why it makes sense. Samuel said that we're still in the grave until our Redeemer comes. That's why the Old Testament saints say we're waiting for their redemption. Why? Because they were going, they were gone down to Abraham's bosom. Look at Luke chapter 16. This is very interesting. The Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into where? Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, now hell is down here, right? In hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Now some people might say, no, the beggar, he went to Abraham's bosom up in heaven. That's what anti-dispensationalists will argue. But no, that's not true. It was definitely down where hell was located, the same spot. You might say, why? And seeth what? Abraham afar off. How can he see Abraham? See, they were in the location there. Let's keep reading. And Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool thy, my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And look, the rich man can even speak to Abraham. How can he do that if uh, they weren't at the same place together? See, they were at the same place. The lost man was in hell. And uh, Lazarus and Abraham, they were in Abraham's bosom at the same location. And they were, like, they were like face to face with each other. How do you know that? Because of verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. See that? See, they were in the same location facing each other because there was a great gulf between them. So that is very apparent and that is very obvious. That's why it makes so much sense why it was down here. Why? Because you cannot have... Full life, complete payment. This was a temporary location, temporary payment. Partial eternal life, incomplete eternal life right here. Until what? They were all waiting for their Redeemer. And when Jesus came down, he set the captives free. That's why it makes sense that they went to heaven. See why dispensationalism makes sense now? Everything starts to make sense. That's why it makes so much sense why the law is also not our salvation. See, when we say the law is not our salvation, it argues for dispensationalism as well. You might say, why? Why does it argue that way? Because Jews don't believe in dispensationalism. They think everything is Old Testament way. But no, because we're dispensationalists, we can argue that there is an Old and New Testament right there. That's why we can argue successfully. Okay, so, uh, oh, by the way, this is very interesting. What do you think Abraham said was their salvation? for the rich man's brothers. Look at verse 29. He never said Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection. He never said faith alone. He said what? They have who? Moses and the prophets. That means the law. You might say, no, Moses does not mean the law. Well, we already looked at many verses about this at Galatians, but let's look at verse 16. 
Moses and the prophets, right? Is that what Abraham said? And Jesus is speaking the same sermon. Look at verse 16. The what? Law and the prophets. But look, dispensationalism. Were until who? Were until John. John the Baptist. See, dispensationalism. Why? The Redeemer was there. He's starting something. And he's going to die buried and resurrected. I hope you enjoyed today's verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. This was really good and rightly dividing. You know how to deal with Jews now, and you also know how to deal with anti-dispensationalists. Next time when we have verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, we're going to cover all the different religions now. It's going to be very interesting. We're going to be covering the liberals. We're going to be covering Ch Church of Christ. We're going to be covering Seventh-day Seventh, Seventh -day Adventists, Black Hebrew Israelites, Hebrew Roots Movement, and all those other guys. It's going to be real good. I hope you'll be here at our next verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. Today we covered anti-dispensationalists and Judaism.